Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for being here in a timely fashion. I appreciate it. Um, I know sometimes um, students don't realize how long it takes to get downtown and find parking and such. So, so we're glad you're here. It's a real pleasure to, rec to welcome you to the eighth annual 7 Under 30 Speaker Series. My name's Wendy Plant, and I'm the director of the Innovation Center for Student Engagement for the Jim Moran College of Entrepreneurship. For those of you who weren't at the kickoff, we were celebrating. We graduated from a school to a college on November 1st this year. It got official, so we were very excited about that achievement. And um, Dean Fiorito is very sorry she couldn't be here today. She had to go out of town to a conference, and she loves this event, so she was uh, disappointed that she couldn't be the one here to welcome you today. Um, before we get going, I'd like to thank our speakers for coming into town and being with us. We are very proud to present this group of innovators and especially delighted that they are all FSU graduates from six different majors. We have education, interdisciplinary social science, retail merchandising and product development, entrepreneurship, exercise science with an emphasis in physical therapy, and exercise physiology. So people come to entrepreneurship from a lot of different paths, and I think they all have a lot of interesting stories to, to tell us today. I'm very happy to see several students from my entrepreneurship and innovation learning community here. So congratulations, first year students. I like to see you getting involved right off the, the bat. That's great. Um, so the first 7 Under 30 event was started by the Jim Moran Institute back in 2012 by Dr. Randy Blass with the inputs of students in entrepreneurship at that time. So it's great to see that this program has continued to grow every year and we can bring back these wonderful alumni. We know that although virtually every profession demands a certain level of entrepreneurial thinking, very few students actually gain entrepreneurial training and experience before they graduate. Whether you dream of starting a tech company, social enterprise, nutrition business, or apparel boutique, the school will inspire you and prepare you by providing a rich curriculum for entrepreneurship majors and minors, an environment that promotes entrepreneurial thinking, hands-on learning, and real-life experience through business mentoring, networking, and internships. And our goal is to give all students the opportunity to learn fundamental business practices that will enhance their career potential and show students at Florida State what's possible in entrepreneurship after graduation. So that's why we're all here today, so you can see. We believe students benefit greatly from hearing from young entrepreneurs like those that are going to be here today. I'd like to thank Caitlin Simpson, Kirsten Franson, people around the room here, um, Rosie Lopez, Kaylee Blanchard, Sterling Saparo, so Spar upstairs, and I'm saying her name wrong, I'm glad she's not out here, uh, Moyer, and all the staff and all the student volunteers here today because this is one of our biggest events of the year. Wouldn't be possible without you. I'd like to thank all the faculty that are here from the Jim Moran College um, that you came and you also brought your students, so it wouldn't happen without everybody's um, help. Um, I know you're eager to hear from this amazing, amazing group. So to move along, I'd like to introduce our student MC who will lead us through the program, Courtney Lauren Faiga. Courtney is a senior commercial entrepreneurship major from Coral Springs, Florida. Courtney started her business, Sun Grown Bakery, last year. They use clean ingredients with no animal byproducts and incorporate some of their baked goods with CBD to help decrease anxiety, depression, and insomnia. So Courtney, thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much, Wendy, for that lovely introduction and quick plug of my business that is Sun Grown Bakery on all social media accounts. Um, yes, yeah, so as you guys may have noticed, there are index cards on all of your seats and pens. If you guys have any questions, please write them down on the index card, and there will be volunteers on either end of the audience. So pass them down, and our volunteers will, co will collect them. And if you don't want to write them down, if you have bad handwriting or something, you can do hashtag 7 under 30 using the numbers, not the words, and at Jim Moran College on Twitter, and we'll have Twitter monitors watching those questions and able to ask them for you guys. So let's get started. Our first speaker today is Adam Kramer. 
So Adam is an alumnus of the entrepreneurship program here at FSU. He was the first student to commercialize FSU technology through the Chempreneur program. And after graduation, he moved to Los Angeles, where he's worked for various startups, billionaires, public companies, and his own angel fund adventures. With a heavy focus on the technology space, Adam designs, builds, and advises on all things tech-related, while also providing insights to other entrepreneurs about structuring their businesses, pitching for capital, and building and managing successful teams. So please welcome Adam Kramer. That's a long walk over here. <laughs> Whew, all right. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, so I'm going to start with some thank yous, just so I know I have the time to get through them. Um, so firstly, uh, when I was actually here as a student, it wasn't an entrepreneurship school. It was a department. So I would like to thank the Department of Entrepreneurship and everything that it has become since then. It's just absolutely amazing to come back and see this grow out of you know two classrooms in the business building. So that's amazing. Um, also, just in general, the amazing teachers, they're so inspiring. I mean, I'm sure you guys have all of them right now, which is, is great. Just being able to learn through the lens of their success is unbelievable. And it really kind of helps to kickstart your education that otherwise you wouldn't get until you experience it yourself. So. Um, uh, a couple people here. Uh, Jim Dever was, you know, pretty much the entrepreneurship teacher at the time, and he's just phenomenal. He's been so successful and really taught us how to look at businesses not as just someone who's, you know, doing it, but someone who's running it and taking responsibility for it, running lean, you know, everything that it really takes to run a successful company for the long haul. Um, Additionally, Randy Blass. Um, I took social entrepreneurship with him, which was something I never thought I would really be into. But uh, I ended up, you know, he really changed my mind. It was just really great to learn how to affect other people's lives with business and ways that you can do it without really, you know, diminishing your own business. So um, getting into me, uh, I graduated in 2009. Um, I was the second graduating class of the entrepreneurship department. Um, I grew up uh, kind of a third of my life in New Jersey, New York, a third in Florida, and then now a third out in Los Angeles, uh, which is where I'm coming from right now. Um, and so, you know, across my career, um, I've raised millions of dollars for my own and uh, clients' startups. Um, I've had three of my companies get angel funding. Um, and, you know, as many entrepreneurs do, have experienced lots of failures. Um, seven failures. <laughs> um, so as I'm kind of talking through some of this, uh, there's a common theme throughout it all, and um, it's really the importance of choosing the right partners that have not only the right skills, but also similar goals. Um, so. My very first company uh, was started when I was at FSU. It was uh, a program we had at the time called the Chempreneurs. And basically, it took a chemistry major or a professor and an entrepreneurship major, stuck them together and you know, with the goal of commercializing FSU technology. Um, so we started a company called Florida Custom Synthesis. It ended up being the very first custom synthesis company in Florida, which is really cool. Um, we just had so much opportunity. It was right when the Florida legislature started to let that kind of business operate in Florida. So, you know, at the time, it was like, you know, the sky's the limit in terms of the type of business we could do. Um, my partner was a chemistry professor and a chemistry PhD student. And um, everything was really great for a while. Um, we got some government funding. We ended up buying a lab in Innovation Park, if that's still around. I don't know. Um, but you know, as things progressed, um, we started to see a lot of differences in the way that you know, they wanted to take the company and the way that I wanted to take the company. And from my perspective, the most important thing was growth. We were the first people here. We had to you know, take advantage of that opportunity and make sure that you know, no one else had an opportunity to come in and just swoop under us because we were not acting as fast as we should have. Um, 
their kind of feeling was, oh, you know, we can be the best, we don't have to be the everything, and that's kind of where things diverged. Um, and so, it went on for a couple months, I'll spare you, but uh, anyway, um, we ended up separating, parting ways. I moved out to Los Angeles and um, started working for startups out there. Uh, the startup culture out there is really cool. There's just so many startups, and they call it Silicon Beach. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty cool. And so I worked for a couple really, really successful people. And um, I always joke, like, they were very successful, but most of what I learned from them was things I don't want to do, not what I do want to do. Um, and so after a couple years, I actually decided to move back to Tallahassee for a year. Um, I was working remotely with a guy in LA, but at nights I became a club promoter. And obviously we know that's really fun here. So um, that was really when I kind of birthed my second company, and that was called Throne VIP. And so Throne was basically a nightlife technology company. We made it easy to like book tables, buy tickets, pay for cover, stuff like that. Um, at the time, I selected, uh, well, so after a couple months, I actually moved back to LA, worked for a couple more years while I saved up money, put you know, almost 100 grand into this company after I saved it. Um, and then I got another founding partner who was a developer. He came on board. And things were great for about eight months until he decided he wanted more equity, he wanted more cash, and you know, more of this divergence of goals and understandings. And um, that ended up putting a really huge damper on the company. He ended up taking everything, leaving. And so that's another really important thing that I want to kind of impart to you guys is protecting your company. And that's not just filing patents. It's not just you know, trademarks. Those are important most of the time. But it's simple things like making sure you know the password to things so that you can't get locked out of systems. Like it, Everything is important in terms of protecting it. That is your business, whether it's a tech company, whether it's the key to your bakery. You, know, you have to have full control and know that you have access to the intellectual property of your company. Um, we actually recovered from that for a couple years, but um, we ended up, um, yeah, well, okay, long story short, we ended up failing after a couple years. But um, something that we had wanted to do for a while when we were doing that was um, kind of the difference between, like, our app was available to everyone, but we wanted to do something that was very exclusive. And especially in Los Angeles, there's you know, lots of really high end stuff and lots of great people that we can target. And so we had a concept that um, after Throne died, kind of turned into its own company. And that's now my current company, and it's called Hall Pass. Um, and so Hall Pass is basically like a high end membership card that gets you access to really cool experiences, services, uh, you know, restaurants, nightlife stuff all over Los Angeles. And uh, we're starting to expand to Florida and other places now, which is really cool. Um, and so my partner in that company, I feel like I finally nailed it this time, finally. <laughs> um, he's fantastic. He's you know, like the biggest promoter in Hollywood. He just knows all the restaurant people, all the you know, clubs, everything. Um, but additionally, we have really the same goals. And we made sure to discuss that up front. It was really important. We outlined everything we wanted to get out of the company, not just in the short term, but in the long term. And it's been just a perfect partnership so far. Um, and so something to really talk about, because I'm reading a little screen here, but uh, fundraising. I don't know if anyone's interested in raising funds for your company, but it's obviously a very important thing sometimes. Um, one piece of advice that I can pass on before I run out of time here is know when to take money and when to hold and get to certain metrics that are going to actually let you take in more money for less. And so you know, always look at. The, the options. I mean, bottom line, you don't want to take money before you need it. And obviously, it's always attractive to take money and think, oh, well, if I can pay myself a salary, if I can do this, if I can do that. But you know, just always realize there's other ways around things until you really, really need it. Um, so anyway, uh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Adam. You provided a lot of awesome, insightful information, especially about finding good partners, because that's very important. Um, our next speaker is Brianna Alley. Brianna Alley is the founder of Bohindi Stream, 
It's a company that she started as a 19-year-old college student in her dorm room and has since expanded into a world of jewelry creation. Bohindi Stream has a strong online community with tens of thousands of spirited individuals supporting a vision, and the company's unique designs are sold in countless stores across the world. Bohindi Stream is a jewelry line that was created for the restless dreamers that see the beauty in each moment of life and the small details that paint our lives. Brianna wanted to create more than beautiful jewelry. She wanted to start a movement. She wanted to spark conversation and unite people through her brand. Brianna has had entrepreneurial spirit in her blood from a young age, dabbling in creating many businesses centered around her creative aspirations since the age of 12. She always knew that she craved the unconventional and wanted to make a unique difference in people's lives. With a free spirit and a distaste for a typically safe career path, she found the most joy in creating Bohindi Stream and inspiring people to believe in possibility. Please welcome Brianna Ali. Hey guys. <laughs> um, so, Thanks for coming out here to hear us all speak and stuff. <laughs> um, so anyways, everybody here knows Florida is hot as hell, right? So I'm going to paint a little picture for you guys. Um, I remember setting up at my first Market Wednesday in August, so hottest month, and it's like 90 degrees out. I'm sitting there drenched in sweat, and I'm like, what am I doing? I'm so unprepared because I'm the only booze without like a pop-up tent, you know? You think that'd be like the thing you think of? But this was like one of many learning experiences of self-awareness, you know, thinking like, okay, my weakness is preparing and being organized, but it started a business anyway. So it's like, you can go for it, you know, do your thing. Um, I started Bohindi Stream six years ago out of my tiny ass dorm room. So you can just imagine it's a jewelry business, so there's lots of little parts like scattered on my dorm floor. Um, my roommates didn't even really know about it. I was kind of private about it at first for some reason. Um, and it's kind of interesting to see it from that point to now, like the other day it was really cool. A customer, she messaged me and she's like, Brie, I was in, and they talked to me like we're friends. They're like, Brie, I was in London and I was walking around with your necklace on and this girl came up to me and was like, are you wearing Bohindi? And I'm just like, what the heck? Like this went from nobody in my dorm room knowing about it to like London. So it's kind of cool um, seeing like the growth and the process of everything. Um, I started by just, you know, writing a one page business plan. That was you know, not the 20 page kind. Um, and just brainstorming what I was going to do and in terms of like selling and stuff because I actually, I feel like a lot of people in the art industry or like fashion in general, they'll just, you know, turn their hobby into a business. But more so, I didn't know shit about making jewelry. I was just like, I want to make a jewelry business. Like, let's see what happens. Um, and I was studying fashion. Um, my major was called retail merchandising and product development. And I minored in entrepreneurship. So I kind of wanted to fuse that into um, what I was doing because I've always been very interested in the creative industry. Um, I just love anything dealing with like, you know, letting your imagination just like run wild. Um, so that's kind of like how we got started on campus. I was juggling it as a side hustle as like while being a student and everything. Um, and then I graduated in 2016 and I went through the whole phase of like, okay, like what do I want to do now? Like I just got my degree, like do I go get a job? Like I have Bohindi, which I love doing so much, but it wasn't lucrative or anything. Like it wasn't like sustainable. Like, oh yeah, I'm earning this big income already. Nothing like that. But I was like, you know what? Like Bohindi streams my passion. This is like what makes my heart feel happy. And I was like, let me see what happens when I put everything I have into it. And you know, you never know until you try. So I did that. And that's when Bohindi Stream started to grow like crazy. And it was just really cool like seeing all that growth through that time. Um, and I mean, it definitely hasn't been a smooth path at all. Like there's so many challenges. Like being an entrepreneur is so difficult, but it's fun at the same time. Like you kind of have to have a certain personality for it. Like liking that challenge and that thrill and like being on the edge of like, oh, like, this just happened, but like, here's the solution. I'm just gonna keep going and rolling with it. Um, so it's definitely like an interesting experience. Um, you work really long hours. I remember in the beginning, I was working like 12 hour days without making anything. So imagine like you're do, putting all this work into it, all this like sweat equity, and like 
you're not making much. And that was the beginning. Like you, you have to do that in order to like grow your business and no one's gonna care about it more than you because it's like it's like your baby. I always refer to it as my baby. I'm like, oh, now Bohindi's a toddler now. <laughs> so it goes through its little phases. Um, but yeah, so that's how it started. And then now we're kind of at a new stage of growth where we're working on like scaling the business and just, um, it's in the creative industry. So with jewelry design and stuff, I'm wearing the jewelry now too, I gotta represent. Um, but it's a lot of different collections we release every, every season. And so that's very exciting. And we create within the jewelry, I always wanted it to be more than like, okay, this is pretty jewelry, like cool. I wanted it to be able to tell a story and I wanted to connect with people through that. And so everything has really fun names. Like there's like pieces called like, but darling, what if you fly or like, road tripping through the stars. Like, there's all kinds of different things. And then um, I'll write literal stories about it. So I even had a piece in particular where it was inspired by my grandpa who had passed away at the time. And I think it was really cool how that piece could connect to so many people because I get very vulnerable and sh super transparent on like our social media and stuff to connect with the customers and stuff. And I remember sharing that story one day with them and I had people messaging me like, oh my gosh, like." I had a similar experience recently with, you know, not to get all sad over here, but like, you know, it's just like a way for people to relate and also see the human side of the brand. Like, hey, like, I'm a girl over here, like, designing things to hopefully inspire other people. So the storytelling aspect was a huge part of Bill Hindi Shroom for me and being able to, like, connect with people that way and then... Um, if any of you guys check out like the Instagram or anything, it's super whimsical, very imaginative. Um, a lot of people say it's like a little fairy land, like it's joy for fairies. Um, so I like to have fun with it and everything like that. So that's kind of like where we're at with growing the company. And yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, definitely. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much, Brianna. Uh, I think connecting with audiences is very important, so I like how you humanize everything. So our next speaker today is Rebecca Cunningham. So Rebecca Cunningham is the illustrator and creative mind behind Cunning Co. Her expertise ranges from watercolor illustration to product development to creative product management. As the founder of CunningCo.com, Rebecca's illustrations and surface pattern designs can be found at major national corporations such as Anthropology and Terrain. She lives in the Old Fourth Ward neighborhood in Atlanta with her French bulldog, Louise. Please welcome Rebecca Cunningham. Hi, everybody. Um, I usually speak really loudly, so I was like, I don't want to scream into the microphone. Um, so I'm Rebecca, but you could call me Becca since we're all friends here. Um, and I am the founder and owner of Cunning Co. Um, and I know that you guys just heard from Bree. Um, Bree and I were actually um, friends starting in freshman year, so I got to see Bohindi stream start, which was incredible. So follow her on Instagram. But um, so yeah, a little bit about Cunning Co. So Cunning Co originally started as um, my creative escape after working a corporate job. Um, so after graduating from the retail merchandising program, I moved to New York City and I worked for West Elm. So I actually originally worked in sourcing. So it was a lot of communicating with China, emailing, um, organization, and working really closely with different teams. Um, but every night I was just like, man, like I just really wanna start something of my own. I wanna do something creative. Um, so I'd go home and I would paint. And I lived in Brooklyn with five roommates. <laughs> So it was a lot, um, but it was incredible. It was an incredible experience because I was surrounded by so many creative people that were hustling, not only on like their business, but on their full-time job. Um, I grew up in a family where my dad, who's here, um, he actually always encouraged me to, oh, it makes me emotional. Um, he always encouraged me to like hustle while I was working. So for a lot of people, um, to have the reality of getting to pour your entire life into a business is a huge privilege. Um, but so having the work ethic to be able to be like, I'm going to work my butt off while I start a company was something that was deeply ingrained in me since I was a kid. Um, so yeah, so I started Cunning Co. as painting dogs in my apartment. So it happened on Instagram. I was posting about um, illustrations that I was just doing in my free time. 
And someone from high school was like, hey, I would love for you to paint a picture of my dog. And so it's wild to think that this whole business just started from one single dog portrait. Um, so I started painting dogs and quickly realized like I had a pretty distinct illustration style. Um, so from there, um, it grew into something um, that could be sold across stores. So I was thinking, OK, what can I put art on that's easily accessible as a low price point um, and is very approachable? And that's how I started doing um, stationary design. So it kind of like just organically grew from painting dogs <laughs> to stationary. And then finally, um, when my stationery was getting recognized, I got my first collaboration with Anthropology, um, which was always my dream to work there. Um, I actually interned at Anthropology after graduating from the retail merchandising program. I see Gail Steed is here, um, fantastic professor. Um, so that internship was a great opportunity because, one, it was during my last semester at FSU, which I highly suggest if you're in the retail merchandising program, go out and do that last internship at a company that you're really passionate about because later on in life, you might end up making connections that turned into something you didn't anticipate. Um, I was a buying intern there, and it turned into a design connection. So I would also say that like, don't feel pigeonholed um, by your major or like, your expertise. Um, just be really willing to learn and put yourself out there. Um, and it will come with like a lot of failures. I know Adam mentioned <laughs> there is a couple, but that's a part of being a business owner is just constantly evolving and changing and problem solving. Um, so that was definitely something that I had to do while I was working a full-time job. Um, so then I saved enough money living in Brooklyn with my five roommates, um, and I decided I wanted to move to a city that was a little bit more cost friendly um, to start a business. So I moved to Atlanta, Georgia, um, which I highly recommend. It's very close by. Um, and so I moved there and poured 100% of my personal savings into starting my business. Um, at the time, I was only 22. So I didn't feel like I had a lot to lose. I was just so invested in this idea of starting an illustration company. Um, and it was the best decision I made. Um, it's definitely hard when you're leaving the comfort of a corporate job. Um, and feeling really successful to be like, OK, I'm going to take like, this secure job and take a risk and do something that you're maybe not getting a lot of external validation. Because you know, there's no, you're making your own corporate ladder. You're forcing yourself to like, like, be like, I'm doing a good job today. And then your customers are telling you, like, you're doing a good job today. Um, so I would definitely say taking a risk is definitely a part of being a small business owner, but it's so rewarding. Um, and then also while I was at FSU, I did the study abroad program in London and Paris. And I think that was definitely a huge inspiration, um, traveling and having different like, world views and seeing what's possible in the realm of creativity. Um, so if you have the opportunity to take advantage of that while you're here, highly recommend. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about Cutting Co and my story. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rebecca. I love dogs, so I'll definitely check out your Instagram. And our next speaker today is Jay Danforth. So Jay Danforth was born and raised in Watertown, New York, and spent the first two years of college in South Florida at Nova Southeastern University before transferring to FSU in 2001. She graduated in 2004 with a bachelor's degree in exercise science with an emphasis in physical therapy. Jay had aspirations of becoming a physical therapist and therefore worked as a physical therapy tech at a local rehab hospital during her last year here at FSU before applying to FAMU's PT program. Then in 2005, she became a certified personal trainer while working at the local YMCA down here in Southwood. Jay then decided to branch out on her own and had a small studio for training clients. Fast forward three years, and in 2008, at the age of 27, her longtime dream, dream of owning her own health and fitness facility became a reality. Jay has owned and operated American Fitness in Bannerman Crossing for 11 years. Please welcome Jay Danforth. Hi there, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Um, yes, I own American Fitness in Bannerman Crossing on the northeast end of town. I've had it for 11 years, like you just heard. Um, it didn't just start out, bam, you own a gym, let me tell you. There's like lots of steps to kind of all of a sudden own your own business, right? Well, for running a gym, 
I went the long way. You know, I could have become a personal trainer and had my degree or my certification in what, a weekend, right? And instead, I went the five-year career first of college. So I first started out at NSU. Um, I did my first two years there, and I decided to transfer up to FSU. And I felt like I had more opportunity for growth individually um, and meet more contacts, network, whatnot. So I did my, finished out FSU with my exercise science and pre-physical therapy degree. So extensive work in chemistry, oh, not my favorite. Um, definitely pre-calculus, you know, all of these classes. And then long story short here, I'm a personal trainer. Um, but I did my, I did my last year of school was at um, Tandem Rehab, which is a rehab facility here in town. And I worked with physical therapists there. And I learned a lot about therapy. And I wanted to become a physical therapist. So patient care was something I really, really enjoyed. I enjoy working with people. I want to help people. That's why I went, wanted to go into that profession. Um, after, a physical, after I worked at Tandem, I decided, well, let me try out the hospital. Let me try a whole different setting. And went to TMH. I worked at TMH. I, kinda, I got a little burned out of seeing lots of rehab of knees and hips, knees and hips, cardia, cardiac, stroke, all of that. So I decided, well, listen, I've got to do something that's more preventative. So I decided, let's do the personal training. I got my certification. When I was at the YMCA, I was a fitness staff person. I was wiping down sweaty machines, kind of like what my current fitness staff people do at my gym. Um, so I understand, and I still do that, actually. It's cleaning toilets is not above my pay grade. Um, I would want to make sure I'm the cleanest gym in Tallahassee, actually. So come check me out. Um, however, I, so where was I? Uh, sorry, fast forward. <laughs> Cleaning toilets, thank you, yes. <laughs> no, but I, I worked in the rehab, and then I decided to go on. And um, I'm just like totally blanking. Sorry, guys. Um, I had a studio, so I left the YMCA, and I had a studio. And then from the studio, I took over uh, in an athletic training facility. I shouldn't say I. I had a partner at the time. And then we decided to go from our little 500-square-foot facility Build out that we built out, and it was in the back of a fitness equipment store here in town. So I built up a clientele, and then unfortunately, just before Christmas, um, the person said, "Well, you've got to leave." So I was like, "What am I going to do with my clients?" So all my clients, I had to pick them up and find them a new place to work out, and. Um, we ended up quickly looking for a place to rent and go a little bit larger because I still had that passion of working with people. And in the, again, that rehab is in the back of my mind still because I love the challenge. Um, so we ended up running into a broker here in town. And kind of how things work, you just kind of happen into things. This person was showing us a space, overheard talk, us talking on what we were going to be doing with that space. And we ended up... He said, come back to my office. I need to talk to you. And we're like, all right, what do we got to talk to you about? You know, we just want to rent your space and turn it into a facility, hopefully. And he said, well, I have a, an athletic training facility. It's 3,000 square feet. I needed someone to manage it. I need someone to be the head trainer. And we're like, oh, wow, OK. Let's, now we're talking 3,000 square feet. That's 500. Ooh, I'm making a jump. Um, so jumped in right into that, took that opportunity. Learned a lot while I was there. I actually had a rehab, not a rehab. There was a uh, machine that we used to help with athletes rehab faster. So we learned about that machine. That is up my alley because, again, physical therapy is still on my back of my mind. Um, and we ended up getting involved in that. And we realized that business, the per person that was running it before, was kind of running it into the ground and unfortunately jumped into a sinking ship. So what do we have to do? I have to relocate my clients again, because those clients that have followed me, some of them followed me from the Y to the 500 square foot to the 3,000. All right, now what do we do? Well, while we were in that small athletic training, the last small, medium size athletic training facility, um, my partner had a friend that was out in the parking lot. And they're like, I'm talking. And they're like, haven't seen each other in a long time. And um, they ended up talking, hey, yo. 
we've got, um, my, my friend's got a gym up in Georgia. You should come check it out. And she's like, all right, yeah, let's go check it out up in Atlanta, Georgia. So we end up going up to Atlanta, Georgia, checking out this gym. And absolutely fell in love with this gym. We were supposed to actually go and sell them this medical piece of equipment to the gym to help with modalities and, and stretching out their clients and their train, like with their, their trainer, use it with their trainers to stretch. And um, they ended up selling us a franchise. So we brought the first small franchise of American Body Works to Tallahassee. So I started out first as a franchise. And very, very quickly, we realized franchise fees are no joke. And when it's the only franchise, we're the only franchise in Florida, then you know, we're not getting the support because all of the other franchises are up in Georgia. So we're the first ones to bring down to Florida. So we ended up getting out of the franchise, thankfully. And instead of American Body Works, we're now American Fitness. I wanted to keep it close to American as something because we didn't want to scare our clientele away and think, oh my gosh, these owners are just up and leaving us. What are we going to do? So we kept our kept it American Fitness. People were calling us American Fitness anyways. They didn't even know our real name. So I was like, <laughs> might as well just keep it. Um, but with that, the franchise ended up selling out to another owner. So the original people that we bought the franchise from, they sold out. And this is what can happen. It gets a little dicey. The gym industry is really, really cutthroat. Um, and I think that it was just me and my partner, and we're both females. So we're in a, a male-dominated industry, pretty cutthroat. They decide, hey, we're going to come and bulldoze down your place. The new people that were, you know, you shouldn't have that name. You need to change your colors, da 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 just threatening us. So that was quite scary, definitely, thinking that your, your dream, your childhood dream, and actually this was my childhood dream to have a gym, knowing that it's going to get bulldozed over because some guy in South Florida wants to tell me that they're going to take away that from me. And then again, lose my clients, so all of that head stuff. Um, we did not lose the gym, obviously. However, running a gym is quite stressful because you have members, you have employees, you have um, neighbors next door that might not like your loud music. So we actually expanded to 10,000. So we originally started out at six. When we had our gym, we brought it to Tallahassee. We had 6,400 square feet. From there, we expanded to 10,400 square feet. That's a pretty big jump, and it's a lot of rent. Price per square foot is pretty high, plus cam. So any of you that know that about renting in Tallahassee, really look into that, because there's another extra charge called common area maintenance. So make that a note in your, if you're looking at renting and having a retail brick and mortar place. Um, anyways, we expanded. Our neighbor didn't like our loud music, like I said. We did a sound check. We made sure they liked it. We had to shut down our classes. So we just sunk in a bunch of money, borrowed a bunch of money, right? And we had to shut those classes down. We had to start the classes after they closed. Really, really heartbreaking, because I had the best dance floors in Tallahassee. It was, I mean, truly the best dance floors. Um, and we had yoga in those rooms. Um, we ended up shrinking the gym back down to now the original, what it is currently, 8,000 square feet. Um, but with that, my partner just was getting really, really just burdened with it. And the morale of our gym was kind of deteriorating, the energy that was happening in there between the two of us. And she was getting frustrated with the members. And I decided in 2013 that it was probably time to part ways. And so we needed to um, go ahead and execute that agreement. And in 2000, end of 2013, the gym was completely on my shoulders. So that was a lot. Um, when you don't have your other partner there to kind of bounce ideas off, it's, it's challenging. So you really rely on your team. And I have an, a fabulous, fabulous team. Because every step of the way since I took over ownership of it, um, the same team has pretty much been there. And that's really, really says a lot, because there's a lot of turnover in gyms. So I don't know if you're members of any gyms in town, but you might see that there's a lot of turnover in the fitness staff. Um, or whatever they might call it. Um, other trainers might be leaving and going to different places, but my trainers, I've been very blessed, and I've had the same trainers since 2012. 2012, we changed our program from being a traditional big box gym with lots of machines 
um, to a functional training facility. And so we brought functional training to Tallahassee in 2012. People are like, what the heck is functional training? And um, functional training is just we want to train the way our bodies move. And that's right back to the line of physical therapy, right? We sit, we stand, we push, we pull. So I'm all about functional training. And our members now absolutely love functional training because we've made training a lot more affordable for our clientele. But there's some clients that want to do their own thing. And hey, we have 24-hour gym access. You can come and do your own thing if you want. We have plenty of equipment. Um, but we've developed a whole, just a, a culture within our, our training program and with our members. And we also want to give back. And our members are super generous with giving back. Um, I'm, I can't be more excited for my members that I have in my gym because we have an angel drive that we just did. And 40 people here in Tallahassee are getting blessed with Christmas. So that's how awesome my members are. They've been, become a community. So we're not just a gym. We're more than just a gym. And that's what my plan was from day one, is not just to be a place where you walk in and you just get your sweat on. I want to know, I know everyone by name for the most part. Um, and like I said, I've had it for 11 years. And there's some people in there that have been there for the whole 11 years. And that's pretty awesome. So I thank you very much for your time. And uh, enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thank you very much, Jay. Your story is really a good example of perseverance and patience paying off. And just to remind everyone, don't forget that you do have those index cards on your seats. And if you have a question, to write it down and pass it down to the ends of your rows. Or tweet us on Twitter at Jim Moran College with the hashtag 7 under 30. And so on to our next guest speaker. Our next speaker is Sunny Ilias. So Sunny is the founder and CEO for Vale Food Company. It is a rapidly growing, healthy, fast, casual restaurant in Florida that offers build-your-own bowls, acai bowls, and also provides catering services. He set out in 2014 to create a concept that the world would appreciate, to provide people with healthy food that is delicious, convenient, affordable, and has variety. In 2016, he opened the first location in Tallahassee in the College Town District. In 2017, he opened in Gainesville in downtown Tampa. In 2018, he opened in Jacksonville and the location inside Premier Health and Fitness in Tallahassee. And this year, 2019, he opened another restaurant in Fort Lauderdale and a third location here in Tallahassee. Please welcome Sonny Ilias. Wow, I got a lot of smiling faces in the crowd. <laughs> All right. Thank you for the intro. You stole half of what I was going to talk about, but you know, <laughs> hey, I'm here. You know, um, uh, very excited to talk to everybody today about my journey. Um, how many people in the room have been to Vail? All right, got some good hands. Hopefully, hopefully, you know, you guys checked out our new location on West Tennessee Street. Um, very excited to share my journey with you guys. I did not have a traditional business background, you know, when I started Vail. And even initially, you know, y'all may notice that, I mean, we're a brick and mortar restaurant today. But how I actually got started was a meal plan delivery business. You know, I went to school here in 2009, you know, through 2014. And in that time span, there was not healthy food options available. You know, at the time, I was uh, getting my degree in exercise physiology, I was working, trying to live a healthy life, and there was no options available. We didn't even have a Whole Foods then. You know, it was crazy. So, I noticed there was a huge need for healthy food options in Tallahassee, and you know, it got to a point where I saw an opportunity, and I felt like I had to solve the problem. You know, at the end of the day, you know, it wasn't about it wasn't about you know was I the best you know at the job. It wasn't about you know having the industry experience. I was just so passionate about solving the problem of making healthy eating affordable, convenient, having variety, and delicious. So I said, you know what? Let me try this meal plan thing, see what I can do. Talk to a few of my friends, convince them, hey, this is something that we should do. Put in some money together. And we you know, convinced a local sports bar that wasn't using their kitchen to sublease us his kitchen. So we thought we had it all figured out. You know, going into there, and I had probably the most horrific first day of business ever. So 
I can tell you this, you know, we planned for weeks, you know, thought everything was going to be perfect. And we hired cooks. We were like, oh, this is going to be a breeze. We had to use the off hours of the bar. So we had to do overnight cooking so that we could service people and deliver people in the morning. So we, you know, uh, we woke up at 5 a.m. The chefs, everybody were supposed to be there. We're hoping to deliver food out by 11 or 12. So we pull up to the kitchen and we're like, man, you know, no lights are on. The cooks were supposed to already be here. Nobody showed up on the first day. So I looked to my left and right to my business partners and I said, guess we're cooking. And I was the only one who had some industry experience. I worked in restaurants growing up, but learning, you know, just doing that stuff on the fly is a perfect example of business. You know, there's gonna be so many curveballs that come your way. You know, that's just part of the game. You know, I usually tell people all the time, if you're getting into a business, you better have a high stress threshold. You know, I don't care what business you're trying to enter, but you have to be able to endure those curveballs because you can plan, prepare, and you know, expect everything to go your way, but those things are going to happen. You know, so that was a rocky start. We started with 20 people on a meal plan. I ended up growing it to 300, you know, 300 people on a meal plan. Next thing I know, I have a full business on my hands. I had no business background. I got my degree in exercise physiology. So all my business education had to be on the fly. You know, I'm literally going into the College of Business trying to get, you know, um, you know, meetings with the professors and talking to them about like, hey, what is accounting and operations and all these things. I didn't have a clue, but I was passionate about what I was doing. You know, seeing my, you know, <clears throat> seeing my customers happy with the food and the product and just being able to work on something and making it better. So I did that for a while from 2012 to 2015. So when, at, when I, I was 21 when I first started. So I was, you know, living in my fraternity house at the time. And, you know, over those course of the years, I started to figure out, okay, how does business really, you know, how does it work? How can you get to a point where you're running a good business? And, you know, through the, those years was really what I needed to get ready for the next chapter, and that's pivoting into the restaurant space. You know, most people, a lot of people, they message me all the time, and they're like, I want to open a restaurant. And I'm like, no, you don't. No, you do not. Because there's so many hurdles along the way that, you know, I learned in those earlier years as a small food business that helped lay the foundation of, you know, getting through the startup phase of a restaurant. Like, had I not had that industry experience of just managing supply chains and food vendors and yada, 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 I would never have been able to handle it. I would have went out of business. But I, you know, in 2016, I went all in. I, I saw myself, I graduated, I was living in Tallahassee, and I was like, you know what, I have to do something bigger. The, re the meal plan was something that, you know, there was a ceiling on how much that I could grow it. So I was like, you know what, if I can convince 300, 400 people to sign up on a meal plan, that's probably enough validation to open up a restaurant, right? So I did it. And luckily, you know, with even going to banks and raising funds, you know, that process is so ambiguous when you're so young. You know, you're like, how do I raise money? You know, and you have to really take as many meetings you can at a young age and try to learn how does it all work. You know, really, really be infinitely curious. You know, that's really, you know, what got me to the point to where I learned enough. I would have a meeting, meet with somebody for an hour, and I'd maybe take away a few nuggets of information. But that allowed me to get enough built up to where I was like, okay, now I understand what these bankers are looking for. Now I understand how to talk to somebody about raising capital. You know, and like I said, I, don't, I didn't have that background. But you better believe I outworked, you know, as much as I can, working 5 a.m. to midnight for those years to be able to make it happen. You know, reading books and books and books and just trying to catch up in the business education standpoint. But I sold myself and I, you know, I went to banks, I convinced them. I showed them my you know, tenacity, I showed them our numbers, and then I had to do the exact same thing in College Town. Our College Town location was our first location. And we had a, you know, there was a make or break meeting where I had to meet with the landlord and he you know, literally was like, I don't know if this is gonna stick, you're a startup, this is prestigious College Town. We don't know if we want to just take a gamble on you. And I looked at that guy and I said, listen, man, I'm going to make this work. And he believed in it enough to give us you know, the go ahead to make it happen. And then there was another chapter of like, oh, man, now I have to learn construction. And then I had to learn you know, all these other aspects of a restaurant and then permitting and then dealing with the city and dealing with all these things. And I learned all of that on the fly. So I can tell you that you know, it was a crazy process to just open the first one. 
And, you know, I really do not wish that much pain on any of y'all. <laughs> you know, but um, it's something that, you know, in my heart, you know, I was looking at, okay, the, the, same, the, the same focus at the start. You know, if we can convince 300 plus people to sign up on a meal plan, we can, you know, that's enough validation to start a restaurant. Like, stay true to it. Keep that passion intact. And, you know, I commonly, you know, I always say is that in business and life and whatever, you know, no one can stop a persistent, passionate person, you know, no matter what. And that's really what all I had at that point. I didn't have the credentials. You know, today I can talk to you and say, hey, I have six restaurants around the state of Florida. I plan on opening up 10, 20 more. And I know what I'm doing now. But really, you have to be that gritty, you know, at an early age and be able to understand that you do not have all the answers, but you have to be able to run at it and make it happen. You know, understand that, you know, you have to look at your weaknesses and start to see, okay, hey, I may not be the best operational or finance person. Let me hire somebody. When can I get to the point to do that? You know, so <clears throat> like I said, guys, it was, you know, that was my start. You know, and <laughs> I drank a lot of coffee along the way, and I've had a lot of coffee today. So, <laughs> um, so that was with, you know, the meal plan, you know, pivoting into the restaurant space, and then scaling a business was a whole other chapter. You know, it was the most humbling experience of my life of going from Tallahassee to Gainesville to Tampa to Jacksonville to, you know, all these other places. So for me, like I said, you know, growth is a, is a you know, is um is a crazy process when you're you know, taking restaurants and putting them all over the state of Florida. But today, I still look at it with the same approach that I had you know, when I had one store. You know, it's like one day at a time, keep that passion flowing, you know, stay at it and be able to, you know, that's gonna really take you to where you wanna be. You're not gonna, make, you're not gonna be a millionaire in one year. You're not gonna be it in two years, three years, wherever the case is. But if you have that passion, it's gonna get you there where you wanna be to grow your company. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sunny, uh, being an entrepreneur, you definitely need passion and the ability to learn every single day of your life. So our next speaker today is Chris Izquierdo. So Chris is a serial entrepreneur who majored in interdisciplinary social sciences while here at FSU. In 2018, he and his partner, Tanya Barahona, started a swimwear company in Miami with only $300. They turned that into over $1 million in online sales in only 15 months. He went from submitting dozens of resumes and job applications daily to reviewing them when his business took off. With more than 25,000 customers globally, Chris has become a brilliant digital marketer and an e-commerce expert. Representing the class of 2017, please welcome Chris Izquierdo. How's it going? So today, I'm going to be sharing my entrepreneurial story with you all. I'm also going to give you two success principles that you could use in your entrepreneurial journey. And I'm also going to define entrepreneurship and explain to you what it really means to be an entrepreneur, right? So my story starts off as I'm a high school kid growing up in Miami, and I played baseball, right? And I was not the best student, to be honest. Uh, 880 SAT score, 2.3 GPA. Honestly, I think Alexa could have done better than that <laughs> on the SAT. And, but I had, you know, I had hustle and I had grit. I was able to um, start a few businesses and more, more hustles and businesses. But I was a kid who would meet up random strangers in CVS parking lots and I would buy an iPhone for 120 and sell it on eBay for 180 because I understood retail arbitrage even though my SAT score didn't reflect that. But um, that's kind of who I was as a 16, 17 year old kid. I mean, locker clean out day, that was my Christmas. Kids would throw away textbooks that were $80, $90. And I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna put those in my backpack and sell these on Amazon. But not immediately, I'm gonna wait till the new school year starts in August because I'm gonna get more from them. That's what it was. So it was kind of in my blood um, to start with. But you know, the, grade, the grades and the, the scholastic achievements, that wasn't me, right? Um, one day I get a call. And FSU wanted me to play baseball. I played baseball in Miami, but it wasn't Florida State University. It was Fitchburg State University. Fitchburg State University is a university. It's about an hour away from Boston. And it was cold. And being in Miami my whole life, growing up there, snow up to your knees, um, negative three degree weather every other day. So I wasn't really a big fan of that. So I said, you know what? I don't want to do this. Um, I had friends who were going 
to FSU and they were having the time of their life. And I'm like, that's where I want to be. So I actually had to go to TCC um, for about a year in order to get some credits to transfer over to Florida State. And then once I got um, admitted into the program, I sat down with my admission counselor and she goes to me, Chris, um, you don't have the requirements to get into the School of Business. It's gonna take you six years to get a four-year degree. How do you wish to proceed? And I said, ma'am, I love business and I love entrepreneurship, but there's no way I'm gonna spend six years to get a four-year degree. What are my options? And she goes to me, Chris, here at FSU, we have a program called Interdisciplinary Social Sciences. And I go, interdisciplinary what? And she goes, interdisciplinary social sciences. Think of it like a Neapolitan ice cream. It's a little chocolate, a little vanilla, a little strawberry. It's a little bit of everything, right? And in an eclectic degree, I learned a lot and it was great. And my time at FSU, I stayed very busy and I kind of took the same principles that I did in high school. I was a hustler. I was always starting businesses, always trying to make an extra buck wherever I could. So I actually taught myself how to be a certified personal trainer. I got the books. Um, took me about a year and that was like honestly the first time I ever read a textbook cover to cover. Um, I learned like human anatomy, physics, physiology, like everything. And I would actually sneak into gyms while I was here at FSU, like the apartment gyms. And I would get my clients like that. And I would basically have a clipboard and I would go, hey, I'm a personal trainer here in the area. Would you like to sign up for a, a free workout? And they'd be like, yeah, sure. Name, email, phone number. Okay, cool. Tomorrow I'll see you at two. And um, i give them the best workout of their life. And then I'd basically uh, pitch them my services. Um, like, yeah, I charge 25 bucks an hour. If you don't, I do meal plans too. <laughs> so that was kind of me. And then um, I started, I failed a lot. So it brings me to success principle number one. Um, and it's on failure, right? I started three online businesses um, apart from the online the training business. It was a fidget spinner business, a hoverboard business, and I even sold light up shoes online. Every single one of them failed. And success principle number one is all about failure. Just because you fail doesn't make you a failure. As a matter of fact, success, I mean failure is a prerequisite to success. There's no way you could succeed without failing. It has to happen. So you need to look at failure as a positive thing and not as a negative thing because it's just one step closer to getting to your goals and to your dreams. So upon graduating Florida State, I go back home to Miami and I'm lost. I'm like, what do I do now? You know, I've failed countless amount of times. What am I going to do? I was in a long distance relationship at the time. Um, my girlfriend and I, we actually met on my 21st birthday, ironically enough, in the beach um, in Miami. And she was up in New York and she goes to me, hey, Chris, if this relationship's gonna work, we gotta be living in the same city together because it's not gonna work much longer. And I said, you're right. I said, we have to do something. And I'm like, well, how, what are we gonna do? We don't have the income to be living together. I said, we're gonna start a business. So we decided to start Breezy Swimmer, a female empowerment uh, e-commerce swimmer company. Um, our first month, April of 2018, when we launched, we did $2,000 in sales. Uh, month number two, we did 95,000. Month number three, we did 154,000. And by the end of the summer, we were not only living together, but we had an office and working together every single day. So um, it was a pretty crazy story how we started. And it just keeps getting better every day. And it was um, a struggle and a grind. But most importantly, and this brings me to success principle number two, is understanding your why, right? What's your why? And my girlfriend was my why, right? Because if you don't have a why, when that alarm clock goes off in the morning and it says 6 o'clock, you're just going to hit snooze. But when you have a why, when you have a reason for what you do what you do, it's a lot easier to get up and, and go do what you got to do, right? And, you know, Breezy Swimwear has been an incredible journey for us and building the, the skill sets within the business um, necessary to succeed has always been a challenge. But I think the biggest thing entrepreneurs often don't realize is the transition between working in a business to working on a business. And that's something that I had to learn myself um, from doing everything to then hiring people to then that metamorphosis of working from going to working in to on. It's very difficult. And I'm going to close here um, by defining what entrepreneurship is and what it takes to be an entrepreneur because I think a lot of people have it twisted. They don't understand um, what it means to be an entrepreneur, right? It's not about putting it in your Instagram bio that you're an entrepreneur and taking a picture next to a private jet or a Lamborghini that you saw on the street in Miami Beach. No, 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 no. Being an entrepreneur is extremely difficult. You have to have extremely high levels of resilience, dedication, and determination. And it challenges you in ways that you can't even think of, right? Um, and I'll, I'll leave you with this. It's extremely difficult to be an entrepreneur, but it doesn't matter where you are today. What matters is where you want to go 
and the price you're willing to pay to get there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Your definition and two key success points were fantastic. If nobody wrote them down or missed them, you'll be able to catch the recording of this on our YouTube channel later. So I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is James Stage. So James is an instructional designer who has worked at institutions in Florida, New Hampshire, and Boston. James has a master's in instructional systems and learning technologies. He focuses on digital modular education systems as well as assessment technology. During his master's program at Florida State University, James served as the entrepreneur in residence for the College of Education. He was awarded the Governor's Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award and has received his college's Alumni Entrepreneur of the Year Award for the company he started while still an undergraduate student here at FSU, Queralize. James works as in instructional lead programs, training the trainer on proper use of digital systems in classrooms, as well as working with teachers on developing innovative curriculum for a variety of class styles. Please welcome James Stage. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, like she said, I still work in education, so every time I'm in a room full of people, I have that compulsion to do like that three truths and a lie thing to break the ice. Um, I won't be doing that with you now, mostly because that's just going to be a flashback to earlier in the semester for most of the students here. Uh, and even worse for the college professors, they hate it more than you know. Um, but that being said, I didn't actually have a lot of prep to do when trying to come up with what I was going to say. Uh, when Wendy Plant mentioned to me a couple years ago I might be asked one day to come back to this, I had to make a deal with her as to what I was going to say. So you're about to sit through several apologies. Uh, the first and biggest one that I have to give out is to Wendy. She came uh, to FSU uh, while I was still in the student business incubator, and I had quite possibly the largest ego of anyone I'd ever met. I was single-handedly going to save education in the United States. I, as a private school student, had seen the problems. I had come <laughs> to Florida State University riding my high horse, and damn it, I was going to fix everything. But then I walked into a meeting with a teacher and said, here's my idea. And they said, who are you? Why are you here? Get out of my office. Um, and that was the first time anyone had listened to my idea and actually given me a negative review. Everyone I'd talked to up until that point had said, well, this is fantastic. This is brilliant. You're really going to make a difference. And uh, Wendy was one of the first people to sit down and said, hey, this is a cool idea. You know what would help? Marketing or bookkeeping or, I don't know, any basic economic concept that helps businesses actually run. And I said, no, no, no. This is education technology. I don't need any of that. I don't have any money. I don't have any customers right now. I'm just pitching the idea. And Wendy said, well, the incubator is going to have all these fantastic events. You should come to those events. And I said, no. I'm going to go have more meetings. That sounds fun. And uh, I kind of realized that Wendy, who had had this experience working with businesses, tons of business up to this point, had immediately identified the key failing to my process up to that point. And that is, I didn't realize what it took to run a business, and more importantly, I thought all these things were ahead of me. I didn't have to worry about bookkeeping because I didn't have money. I didn't have to worry about marketing because I didn't have something that I wanted people to use yet. And then I got some money, and I had to spend way too much of it to create backwards compatible books, so I didn't have to owe as much in taxes. Then I walked into a meeting and someone said, we looked you up on social media, we couldn't find anything. Becca reminded me of that in the green room earlier, that I don't have Instagram, which apparently makes me old. <laughs> so there are still things that I'm learning, apparently, and I'll be making an Instagram later with your help. <laughs> but these are things that Wendy really tried to push on me, and I rejected. I did not want to do them, because I didn't think that's where I was yet. And that's the biggest thing I can say to an entrepreneur is, you don't know everything yet because you haven't had to experience those things. And even though you think you're special, your idea is special, it's unique, and you are probably the only person who's thought of that particular application in that particular way, there are still things that other people have come before you and learned about the business in general. And you have to keep that in mind. Uh, the next apology goes out to Dr. Blass. 
I was a senior in his class, and I can remember very clearly him saying, wow, James in the front row, you have senioritis. I haven't seen you all semester. Um, but there was a test, so I had to be there. I learned in freshman year, you can't skip the tests. Um, I didn't go. At the end of the day, when I did start attending his class, mostly out of shame, but also out of a need to pull my grade up, uh, I realized the people he was bringing in, even though they didn't do exactly what I was doing, even though the stories they were telling weren't exactly the stories that I was looking for, namely, how do people raise half a million dollars? Who do you have to know? Uh, they were still helpful. And I didn't want to listen to those stories. I didn't want to go into a class where I thought I was going to get lectured to and then not gain what I thought I was paying for by taking the class in the first place, outside of the three credit hours necessary to graduate. But I needed that. After going, after listening, after realizing that there are some universal experiences, and in the first six speakers, you heard them. If I have to say the word failure one more time, I think everyone's head is going to explode, but it is the most constant experience you have as an entrepreneur. Uh, the next one goes out to Professor Tatum. Um, that man. <laughs> I love it when he walks into the room, mostly because I realize he's about to tell me something I don't want to hear. Um, and it always starts with valuation. I love it when he starts talking about valuations. But he would come in, and I had to do uh, the same thing that Bree was telling you about. I had to write the business plan, but Tatum didn't let me do the one-page business plan. I did the 20-page business plan. And my relationship with the written word is casual at best. Uh, if someone were to grade my papers, they'd just have to slit their wrists over the thing and start <laughs> highlighting where I actually got it right. Uh, so he sits down, looking at this 20-page paper that he made me write, and says, well, you know what? I only care about the first two pages, and I wanted to hit him. Right there, I just remember sitting in the incubator thinking, you, mm, but he started walking me through. This is what it means to actually have a business plan. This is what it means to have thought through the things that are necessary for you to be able to pitch an investor. And I didn't want to hear that. I wanted to hear that I either had what I needed or that he was going to give me what I needed so I could then make it to the next phase. I didn't want to listen to the things I had to change or the things I had to improve. And by doing that, I went to a couple of people. I tried to fundraise. They were probably the right people to fundraise to. But because I didn't initially listen to Tatum, because I was waiting for a very specific answer that I didn't get, I didn't put my best foot forward. And in so many areas when it comes to clients, especially when you're a startup, there is some allowance for failure. When you're trying to raise money, there is none. If you alienate someone that you're trying to get money from, if you make it seem like you're not prepared to take a large sum from them and do something with it, you don't get another chance. You have shot your shot, and it's over. So uh, Tatum knows what he's talking about, and if he will give you some of his time to provide his input, he is an expert in what he does. Uh, and with my limited time left, my last apology goes to uh, Mike Campbell, who knew this one was coming as well. But Mike's one piece of advice that I give to you all as well, chase the money. You might think you have a great idea. You might have a little bit of money in your pocket. But if you're not constantly fundraising to make sure that you can keep doors open and you keep developing the way you need to develop, you're going to come up on hard times. Either your fault or not your fault, you will run into a problem, and that is something that you can't backwards operate out of. You need to keep pushing forward. You need to constantly be taking those meetings, right? Just like Sonny said, you'll be taking meetings constantly, and it's one of the most valuable things you can be doing. Uh, so I'm not going to run over too much. Thank you all for your time. Thank you very much, James. I think as entrepreneurs, it's hard to take constructive criticism, but I'm glad you got some awesome ones from Tatum. He's a very interesting man, is right. Um, so I'd like to welcome all of the speakers back up for some Q&A. So if everyone who filled out their index card could pass it to the volunteers that we have on either side, and they will be going up to the microphone to ask the questions. Again, we have the hashtag 7under30, and you can tweet us at Jim Moran College. So the speakers will have very short answers, very concise. However, if you wish to have a longer conversation with them, there will be a reception afterwards where you can pick their brains a little bit. So with that being said, do we have our first question? I guess this is a general question, so whoever wants to take this first. How do you deal with failure and still have motivation to try again? 
Rum. <laughs> <laughs> but also positive reinforcement, having a team that really is there, uh, be it friends and family, be it mentors, uh, and just being willing to be somewhat vulnerable to ask for help, uh, and also at some point to recognize that you have made a mistake or that you have been put in a situation where you got to pick yourself up. Awesome. And then there's a second question on this card as well. So what was the shift or a catalyst that made you want to start a business? Whoever wants to take that, just go right well, on for ahead. me, I mean, um, it was to end my long-distance relationship. I was in a long-distance relationship for two years, and it was like, this has to come to an end. So we had to start a business. And it was swimwear. We, we chose swimwear because when I was at FSU, I had um, started a few websites, and I kind of, like, learned how to do, like, e-commerce, digital marketing. And that's kind of where I got um, putting most of the work, and I learned. And through that, um, I said, swimwear is really easy to market. This is going to be a home run. I mean, all these influencers are wearing swimsuits every day, so it's like, this is easy. So, I mean, it, that's, it comes down to having a why. Okay, I have a, is this mic working? Yeah. <laughs> all right, a couple questions for Chris. To, to what do you attribute the fast growth in sales? So our fast growth in sales pretty much came from having a good sales funnel in place. And basically what a sales funnel is, it's just... Um, it's a customer journey and understanding how um, you got to hit the customer with multiple touch points. And, you know. So we had set up an influencer funnel where we have people apply to become brand ambassadors or influencers, if you will. And um, since we're a body positivity brand, all inclusive, everyone gets accepted into the program. And then we make, um, as a requirement in order to like, become official as an ambassador, you have to make a purchase of uh, a swimsuit or anything you want on the site. So basically, it's just a, it's a good marketing strategy because if you think about it, swimwear is extremely competitive. I mean, it's... It's a red ocean. I mean, there's so many people who sell swimwear from Target to Fashion Nova to Forever 21. I mean, it's super competitive. So you have to have um, the skill in marketing and sales to be able to drive uh, sales home. Yeah. That was really the same thing on this one. <laughs> Rebecca, uh, being a creative, what way did you find best to get your work out there? Um, so me personally, social media was everything. Um, this is, okay, sorry guys. Um, I was actually just talking to Bree and everyone in the green room that um, I would say 90% of my sales come through Instagram traffic. Um, so that's for stationary goods, um, for direct to consumer, as well as my um, wholesale stockists. Um, so I think that Social media, especially Instagram, has been such an equalizer in the art community because before you used to have to be in a gallery or go to these massive trade shows to kind of build your brand and identity and get in front of the right people. But now it's everyone has a platform and you could have a voice and make a Squarespace website and um, get it out there. So I think I would just highly recommend to any creative to really pour into social media. <laughs> this can get anybody. Um, if you know your business will take time getting funds, how do you pay yourself to live? I think it's pretty important that you always have some side hustle going. I mean, whether it's a full-time job or other things that you know are always consistently keeping you above water, like you can't focus on growing a business if you're suffering in the rest of your life. So, you know, like for me, it's just a side web development business. I like turn up the volume on it when I need more money and I turn down the volume when I need to spend more money or sorry, more time on my other companies. And so, you know, whatever that side hustle is or full time job, I mean, everyone has to go through that at some point. If you're lucky enough to just be super wealthy and not have to work, that's great. But the majority of people just aren't like that. In education, a lot of people will work as teachers or as support staff in schools, partially because in the fundraising process it lends credibility. You're not just someone who thinks they can lecture to an industry or you can prescribe something to an industry. You are experienced in that industry and you have the capacity to uh, connect both credibility when you're selling to the educators, but also as someone who understands what's going on in the space. How do you all create a work-life balance? Is that difficult? Um, and how do you manage it as an entrepreneur? Uh, I'll take a page out of Bezos' book. It's like a harmony. You know, like, I work seven days a week, and I, ha I have for seven years, you know, and I can tell you that, you know, it's just knowing your schedule, when can you unplug, when can you not, and understanding that, you know, you, 
you know, I, I'm almost happier that I, I am staying on top of everything on a daily basis, and I find different pockets of time where I can make time for myself, but that takes time. You know, you're not going to have it right away, but you, you start to figure it out. And obviously, as you make more hires, you can stop wearing so many hats to where you get back some portion of your life. Uh, what characteristics make for the best teammates when you're trying to hire people or work with people? Being driven is obviously an important thing, but you know, like I was kind of mentioning earlier, I think having a similar vision is almost always more important. If someone wants to go towards the same goal as you and you can walk together on that you know, journey, that sounds super cliche, but you know, that's just ultra important. You can find people that come from different backgrounds, different skill sets, and it really almost doesn't matter as long as where they want to get to is the same place you want to get to and you feel that you can do it together. Um, Chris? How did you launch your online sales and get really started up with that? And what books or a book would you recommend uh, for me for online sales? So what was the first part of the question again? Um, how did you start online sales, like launch it and get going? So sure, we use this Shopify as our platform where we sell um, our swimsuits. And it was actually pretty crazy because we didn't even have inventory. Because we started with $300 and we turned it into over seven figures in 15 months. And um, we were shipping stuff uh, we were selling stuff on the website that we didn't even have inventory for, so we were literally taking the money in to then buy it. Um, and that's kind of how we initially started. And then uh, we just couldn't like hire fast enough. It was just crazy. Like We were literally putting out job posts like every single day. And I was at the point where I was about to take another job before starting. I was like submitting resumes myself. And then like five weeks later, I was reviewing resumes, which was even crazier. But um, And to your question, as far as with the book, um, I would read... Let me think of a good book here. Um, the 10X Rule by Grant Cardone's a good one. It's a good sales book. I'm curious about something, because you say on your, your swimsuits are female empowerment, so how, how is that? Sure. So our mission is we believe that every body is a bikini body, so that's like our trademark slogan. Um, and what we're trying to do is really encourage like body, body positivity and all inclusiveness. So. It's, it's kind of like an aspiration right now because we're still working on including more diverse models um, on our site. But um, we're carrying plus sizes now. We're up to 3X. And what we've gotten, the feedback we've gotten has been phenomenal. We have people from all over the world sharing their stories of how um, you know, our brand was able to help them overcome their, you know, their body issues and how they feel in a swimsuit. And we're really like, empowering women you know, globally to feel good um, in a swimsuit no matter what they look like or you know, so. What one thing do you wish you had known about life when you were an FSU student? Those of you that were FSU students. Everybody. Everybody. <laughs> I screwed up. To everybody, anyone that wants to answer that. Yeah. That's a hard one. That's a hard one. so open-ended. Um, I think not to be like, I wish that I knew that just because plans change, it doesn't mean that it's even a failure, and failure is good. But I think that when you're in college, you're going to be like, I'm getting this degree to get this job, to move to this city, and then I'll be successful. Um, so I think I wish I almost like knew that success doesn't have to be in the form of like having the multi-million dollar company or, and it sounds so basic, but it's like convincing yourself that you believe that definition of success for yourself. Um, so that's what I wish I knew back then. I would say, like, you know, don't be so tough on yourself to, like, hold, you know, expect to be at a certain level at a certain age. Don't ageism yourself where, like, you know, I, I have to graduate and I have to work at this place or I have to be doing this or this because at the end of the day, you know, there's going to be curveballs like I talked about. There's going to be, you know, it's a journey. You know, and I think it's, you know, about understanding that, you know, you, you're going through, you know, your whole life on a prescribed schedule, you know, where you go through elementary, middle, high school, and then college. You're just on a track, but then you graduate, and like you're expected to just continue that track. And it's okay to not have everything figured out. It's so it's okay to give yourself that time to you know uh, find your passion, your love, or try different things. Sunny, 
How has your perspective changed as you have gone from two local stores to five plus markets? Um, every decision I make is so much more calculated. You know, before when you know you're operating in one market, you know, I, I was able to just pivot, you know, on a drop of a dime. Okay, now we're doing this. Now we're doing this, 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 and now everything has to be about scale. Everything has to be about consistency and quality across the board. So now, you know, I would say everything is just more macro. You know, all, you know, overall with my perspective and understanding that you know, it's bigger than just one store or it's bigger than just my idea. You know, it's really doing the due diligence now of saying, okay, hey, how does everything check out you know, when you, you know, uh, scale it throughout the state? Do we have our suppliers there? Do we have, you know, you know, how, how are we gonna operationally roll this out through training videos and everything? So there's a lot more due diligence now. Yeah, another question for Sonny. Um, how did you benefit from being in a fraternity? First 20 customers, right there. You know, I'll tell you right there. You know, easiest you know, 20 customers I ever landed. You know, I said, listen guys, trust me, it's gonna be good. And I got some of the best feedback ever because they told me that meal was good, that meal sucked. You know, so they didn't sugarcoat it. You know, um, and you know, overall I was lucky enough to be surrounded with a you know, great group of guys that we're very similar minded and we happen to have a very entrepreneurial you know, culture in our fraternity where you know, I started a business, that sparked another group of people to do it and other people and next thing you know, like now even today, I mean I have a lot of my great friends that they all own businesses and um, it's, it's, you know, it, I think overall it was beneficial in that, in that way. Politics. We lobbied. Our first, uh, our first contract was we, this is something that Mike Campbell really taught me. Um, a lot of people know they have problems. They don't know how much their problems are costing them. So sometimes it's up to you to quantify how much someone's problem is costing them. So from our perspective, the problem that we try to alleviate costs the state about $150 million a year. We put together a white paper. We got a uh, congressman to sponsor a bill in order to test out the solution and then we went and bid for the contract to try and solve the problem given that we wrote the white paper we pretty easily fit into the bill that was passed so we, we used a political mechanism to get in for the first contract. On a smaller level with that um, in addition to social media I've actually made all the things that have benefited my business were actually connections I made at other jobs that I was working full time. So um, obviously like anthropology was when I was interning there. Um, at, when I started doing stationery, I actually got a job at a local stationery store in Atlanta and made them become one of my first stockists. And it just turns out that the man that had that store had seven other stores. And he was also had a wholesale buying room in the Mart. Um, so I think that also allows you that if you are working another job, find a job that's gonna leverage your business. So maybe you don't know anything about social media marketing. Maybe get a job just working at their front desk to make extra money and then all of a sudden you're like, wow, I'm learning so much about this and now I'm gonna use that information to put towards my own business. Yeah, I think something that was really important for me as I kind of progressed, I've always been in tech, but um, when I had my first big tech company, everything was really solved by coding each thing. You had to actually make what you wanted to make. Um, technology has progressed so much over the last couple of years. There's so much in automation now. There's so many really just amazing tools that can solve problems for you to where you don't have to put a person behind solving the problem. You can do it with technology. So you know, I would definitely say anytime there's a problem, the first thing you should look for is a tech solution because it's going to be way cheaper than a human and way less error prone. We have a Twitter question. Um, Chris, your relationship seems to be an important part of your entrepreneurial journey. How did you manage to balance your relationship and business? Was your girlfriend business minded as well? So it's very difficult, um, not only to like have a girlfriend that you live with, but also work with, because obviously what happens is like the relationship and the work, um, they often bleed into each other, so there really is no like boundaries. Um, 
And of course, like any relationship, you're going to have your arguments and your struggles. But it's just all about, it comes down to one thing, one, one word only. And I think it's communication and just being really understanding of one another and just working together as a team um, and communicating what the end goal is and why we're doing this, right? Um, so I, I think the biggest piece of advice would be um, just to communicate. And I think it's, it's a challenge, but as long as you have good communications and you guys are on the same page, um, you'll, you'll figure out a way to make it work. OK, so this is to Jay. Uh, what are the extra fees you deal with on top of rent? Extra fees um, for common area maintenance, I think they were asking. Yeah. I, that's, that's like groundskeeping. So if you, you pay per square foot. Um, how much square foot you're renting, you pay that as a flat base rent, and then you have a, an additional common area maintenance. And that's keeping the parking lot clean, that's maybe garbage is in there, um, and where I'm at, it's water is included in there. And so I have to pay an additional dollar amount, I'm not gonna name it dollar amounts, but um, per square foot. So I have 8,000 square feet plus a few more dollars, let's just say, on top of what I'm already paying as a base rent. And that's pretty much what every place will have, unless it's all built into one. And then it's going to be one big nugget. But I'm in the northeast end of town. It's a little pricier out there. Um, but so is Midtown and all of that as well. So, but it depends on your location, too, where you're going. Some places might not have it, but you might want to check the parking lots and <laughs> make sure there's lights and safety and all of that. So you get what you pay for. Um, and then Brianna? Do you ever market yourself wearing your own jewelry? Um, yeah, I'm like always wearing my jewelry just because I feel like when I meet someone, I'm like, yeah, I have a jewelry business. It's nice to be like, oh, and this is what I design. Um, and then especially like on the Instagram, which is like our big, like, what, like our biggest social media platform where I like have a close connection with our customers and stuff. I do like this series called Bohindi of the Day. And I literally talk on the Insta story and I'll be wearing a different piece. And it really helps because then they feel like this connection with me and they almost, like, they'll literally buy what piece I'm wearing that day. And I'm like, this is kind of cool. So yeah, I definitely like wearing the pieces. And when I first started, that's actually like what, how it helped me design. I designed pieces that I would personally wear. So it always fit my style. And then it's still like that, but now it's kind of evolved to like, now I know what my customer likes and like what specific style she's into and what she's not into. And we even have like, we have this fun thing called which Bohindi babe are you, which is like our, what I call a customer. And it's actually a personality quiz where it'll match you to jewelry pieces. And the thing about that is the customer gets like this fun shopping experience out of it. But then for me, it's like profiling them in a way. So it's like, OK, I know this type of girl is most of our customers. That means she likes this style of jewelry and stuff. So it helps like the design process. So I'm not like wasting time making jewelry no one's going to want to wear. So, but yeah, I learned my own jewelry. Um, so, who comes first, yourself or your business? <laughs> business. <laughs> your business. Unfortunately, it's business most of the time. I would say you got to put yourself first because at the end of the day, if you ever go on an airplane, it's the first thing they'll tell you is that you always got to put on the oxygen mask on yourself before you can help somebody else. So if you're not taking care of yourself, your body, your mind, you can't take care of your business. Um, I, you, you obviously need to prioritize your business, but you also have to prioritize yourself. And sometimes, as entrepreneurs, you tend to forget that. You just work yourself to the grave almost. And it's like you're working countless, countless hours, and you're not even taking care of your own personal health and hygiene. And you know you forget to do that. But then you, you, when, you, when you start to, to take time for yourself, you notice that your productivity and your efficiency just goes through the roof. Yeah, I can definitely say, you know, in the early years, I was getting five hours of sleep a night, you know, and that was horrible. And today, yeah, I prioritize health and sleep definitely. I mean, I can tell you, I appreciate any night I get seven, you know, that's <laughs> like a blessing to me. I really, really cherish that. But uh, that's, a, that's a really good point. I think also to an extent, it depends like how far into a business you are. Like, I mean, in the beginning, if you're not willing to sacrifice some things, you're not going to make it, and that's the reality. And you know, it, at a certain point, you get to a place where you understand how much your business needs and how much you need, and that balance is probably different for everyone. But you know, in the beginning, I mean, none of us would have made it if we didn't have those sleepless nights, and it's really a necessary thing at some point. Businesses 
that are centered around your particular skills, your hand skills, your art. How are you um, dealing with scaling up your business? Are you are you passing on your skills to technicians? Do you, do you have other people in the workshop? Tell me a little bit about how you're growing your business. Yeah, so with me, I started off by doing everything myself, like make, physically making jewelry and stuff, and obviously that's not sustainable. So we had to, we decided, so we outsourced a lot of the things within my company. So we have a manufacturer who builds all the designs um, after I make this initial sample for it. Um, so they produce it at higher quantities, so we're able to like fulfill the orders and stuff because otherwise, like, Let's say we do a lot of influencer marketing and stuff too. So like, let's say we send an influencer something and suddenly like we get hundreds of orders for it. It's like, I can't make that. That's going to be crazy. Um, so yeah, we outsource it and it's just, that's been a major learning process because it's like you have to learn to streamline everything. And right now we're even looking into like possibly outsourcing the fulfillment part now because we're doing in-house fulfillment, which is basically like packaging the orders and shipping them out. Um, but it's, a lot of streamlining and just like learning as you go because you don't really know all of that in the beginning. It's like, okay, like now I need to teach people how to do what I know how to do so then I can focus on like what Chris was saying with like working on your business, not in it. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of like the stage I'm at right now, um, just making those transitions. Yeah, this was actually something uh, we talked about on the podcast today as well since we all got interviewed for the podcast. Um, I 100% ran into this issue right away because um, I can't outsource painting something that someone wants from me as an artist. Um, so then I was trying to get creative of, okay, what are ways that I could generate revenue that I could like potentially automate in the future? Um, so that's when I actually started teaching watercolor workshops. Um, so after I built a reputation surrounding my stationery and just like custom illustration, I was getting a lot of people that were interested in learning the process. Um, so I started making course packets and course guides, um, and I've been going around the U.S. and partnering with brick and mortar locations to come into their stores and um, host like a wine and painting session to teach people. Um, and it's been great because it helps build community. And then in the future of that, I'm like, okay, so this is in person. I'm making this connection. I'm bringing people together. But then the future of it could be, okay, now this is I can take all of those courses, offer an online class, um, and kind of just get creative of like how could I scale watercolor. So, how do you all feel about brand ambassadors? Um, well, I personally have brand ambassadors, and I love it because it's like. Um, they're going to be really loyal customers and they're excited to share about the brand and stuff and they're very plugged into the vision. So I think it's a great way to have just like tons of people talking about your brand and getting other people excited, especially like when it comes to word of mouth because, you know, I feel like when you hear like your friend tell you something, you're way more inclined to be like, oh yeah, I'm going to check that out versus like, oh, maybe I just saw an ad and that's a random computer talking to me. Um, so I think it's a great move on business personally. I would agree with that 100%. I mean, our whole business is uh, predicated on influencers and brand ambassadors. Um, it's, it's huge. It's Like she said, she hit the nail on the head. Um, it's a lot simpler and, and more native when your friend is telling you, hey, buy this, versus uh, a company saying buy this, right? Um, and I think influencer marketing is just only going to grow. I mean, the numbers show it. It's growing year over year. Um, the industry is just booming. And I think 86% of people now want to be influencers, and that's something that we, I think it's an early trend that we were able to catch, and part of our early success was that we were running, fa you know, running Facebook ads. And to the question earlier, like how, how do we get so much uh, initial success? It was through those Facebook and Instagram ads, marketing our, our influencer and ambassador program, and that's kind of how how we leverage that. So, Sonny, how often do you eat at Vail? <laughs> Honestly, I'm sad to say it's every day. Honestly, you know, but you know, I'm still not sick of the food. And you know, I mean, I created the menu, the concept. You know, so to me, you know, I always tell my team I'm very tough on my team, and I always tell them I'm like I will literally go to your, I'll go to the restaurant at any moment, and I'm gonna be trying the food. So that we have to always make sure our quality is at a high level. But yeah, I eat veil every day. It's just so easy. You know, for me. You know, I love it because you know, I always tell people, like, if you want a healthy meal and you want to just get back to work, it's a great place where you can get what you need, get back to the grind. So uh, we do very well in our working professional markets, college markets. Um, so yeah. 
Um, what are some good habits you all think you should get into uh, to be a successful entrepreneur? Scheduling. Um, so it sounds kind of funny, but one thing I picked up when I was working for a very successful person was he scheduled every minute of his day. And not necessarily like, okay, this is who I'm talking to at this time, but in terms of um, between, let's say, 9 a.m. and 11 a.m., I'm going to work on this type of stuff. And from you know, 12 to 1, I'm going to work on this type of stuff. And it's different for every kind of person, but you know, the more that you start to kind of fit certain type of work into certain times of your day, the more you start to kind of understand when you're most productive doing certain things. And obviously, there's some stuff that just won't fit into that. But um, especially when you work on lots of different projects, that's something that I've found is like really helpful. Like no matter if I'm working on one thing or three things across different companies for that day, if I'm doing it, you know, all in one chunk of kind of mind space around when I'm doing it, it, it's really helpful. I think an another thing I think about is um, there was this quote I forgot who said it. So if anyone knows, but it's like be the burden, like in your friend group, like be the one that you feel like you're dragging them down because you don't know as much around, like since you're constantly learning from the people around you. So surround yourself with people that are smarter than you and know more about everything and always be the one that's like, wait, what's going on? Like, how do I do that or how do I figure that out? Um, I think that would just, has helped me in so many way to, ways to just surround myself with people that are far smarter than me, so. We have a uh, Twitter question. Um, so what is the number one reason that businesses fail? Anybody? <laughs> That's tough. I feel like sometimes with businesses, they like grow too fast to where they kind of implode, if that makes sense. Like, it's like a, the overnight successes that can't like sustain. Like, I feel like for my company, I've grown it so incrementally and like organically, it's been able to sustain itself. Like, sometimes you might hear like, um, this company's doing this much in sales per month and you're like, wow, that's awesome. But like the behind the scenes of it is like, they might not even have cash flow because they're dumping so much into inventory and it's tied up this way. So I think like incrementally growing is like the way for like long-term success a lot of the times. But I mean, everybody's different too. I would say not listening to your customer. You know, at the end mm -hmm. of the day, you know, I've made, you know, tremendous amount of changes to my company you know, off of feedback, off of, you know, listening to our customers and, you know, hearing what they want, you know, from us. And um, that's, you know, I think is, you know, very vital for, you know, businesses to, you know, make those decisions and don't move too slow. Because, you know, if you wait, you know, if we wait too long to, you know, change, you know, customers may just leave you. And that compounding effect, you know, can put you out. And I think failure, as it relates to business failure, a lot of people like to point that money is the reason why businesses fail. And that's obviously a, a, a big factor, but I think it's, it's more so the experience in the entrepreneur, right? Like if I go pick up a basketball and say, now I'm gonna be in the NBA, that's not very likely. So I think a lot of people think that they could do something even though they've never done it. So it's like, you have to understand, like you probably have a very high chance of failure because you've never done it before. And as the more experience you get, the, the probability of success goes higher and higher. So if you don't have the expertise in like, for example, like I'm not gonna go start a restaurant because I don't have, I don't know anything about the restaurant industry. So my chances for failure are through the roof. But now if I go start another e-commerce company, my success percentage goes even higher. So it's, it, it's the experience. And you build that experience by, you know, trial and error and then just learning from your mistakes. We have time for two more questions, so. All right, so how did you all start making profit outside of reinvesting your money back into your business and personal uses? Profit sounds nice one day. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta understand your economic model. You know, you gotta know what you're what you're getting into. I mean, a lot of times when people start a business, they're not, you know, truly understanding the econo you know, the economics. They're just like, I want to do this, right? And then you gotta break it down and like that's you know really getting tied into the financial side of like what are you doing? You know, just because you like to do something doesn't always mean that it's going to make sense. You know, there was times where, you know, when I first started, you know, our food cost was like 50, you know, 50%, 60%. Like, I can't run a restaurant like that. So we had to really you know, dig in deep into where, okay, how can we solve this problem? So that opened up another, you know, thing. But you have to know, like, you know, your business to where, you know, you can't grow your business if you don't know your finances. You can't grow it if, 
you know, no bank, no person with a brain is going to lend to you if you don't have something that's sustainable there to show that you can service what you're trying to borrow. So you got to understand your economic model. I have a question for Sunny. <laughs> <laughs> so have you considered franchising, or do you want to keep doing things internal, and what's um, your path there? <laughs> I know, I know, I know. The podcast. But um, um, I've uh, toyed around with, you know, looking into franchising. But, you know, for me, like I said, I don't want to give somebody the keys to a car they can't drive. And, you know, I have over 100 plus, you know, franchise applications. Um, but for me, I just, you know, I'm not interested in it right now. I think maybe at a future, you know, down the road date, but I like to control everything and the quality. And I've done my due diligence in terms of like looking at companies that franchise too early. And most of the time, it's not pretty. You know, if you're in any business for the quick buck, you probably shouldn't be doing it. You know, because it's not, you know, every, everything that you see out there that's like, you know, get rich quick and that type of stuff. It's just all you know, smoke and mirrors. You know, at the end of the day, you know, I'd rather control everything and grow at my pace. Keep in mind, um, even though our Q&A session is now at a close, you are able to speak with the speakers afterwards. So if you have any personal questions about certain things, about your business or other specific questions that weren't answered, feel free to ask them then. And now I would like to welcome our lovely Wendy Plant back to the podium for some closing remarks. Thank you all, that was awesome. I really appreciate everything you had to say. Let's give them a round of applause. So I just wanna mention a couple of things and I wanna say this is Tallahassee Startup Week. Uh, you probably know that by now. We've tried to make sure everybody knows. Tomorrow at six o'clock right here, Dr. Mark McNeese will be having Lisa Boyd um, Skype in on this screen from Lyft in California. She is their um, corporate responsibility officer, and um, it should be a great session. So we hope you will come back tomorrow and join us for that. Um, and his podcast, Dr. McNeese has started a podcast series that is available. If you go to the Jim Moran College's website, there are links to it, right? So it's it's several of them are in the can that are already on there and available, and several more got, got um, I guess it's not filmed, recorded earlier today. So, so look for those, because it gave some of the speakers a chance to go a little bit deeper into some of the questions that you might have had, too. So we appreciate you all being willing to, to also share your, your knowledge with them for the podcast. So um, that's all I have. Thank you for being here. And